How have you enjoyed the day so far? I have enjoyed it a lot. In fact, I've learned so much from the people speaking that now I have things in here that I was not planning to. And I nerd out, so I look bullet I like bullet points and note cards, so <laughs> you'll see me referring to those. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so lovely to have you here and you know the North Group has been a, a big supporter of the events that we've been working on. Uh, some people might look at your work and say that you're primarily interested in the world of EP and, uh, and, and corporate security, but we're talking crisis communication. Um, I guess why and what are crisis communications? Well, I think first of all, to start out, um, I do not have the EP or security tactical background. So I was a news anchor for almost 20 years, got out and got recruited into private security, which ironically seems to be a natural fit since I'm a military brat. My dad flew fighters in the Air Force. I spent my entire childhood around military, base to base to base to base to base. All the females on my mom's side were law enforcement or one was a prison guard, a sheriff's deputy. So, I mean, if I found a home, it's now, right? But I think I learned so many lessons along the way with media that parlay so well into this sector that I think probably no one would even guess, right? So before I jump into even what crisis communications is, I would just say the value of communications in general, right? The, the tone through every presentation is communicating across different lanes with different managers to get the proper message across to be able to effectively and efficiently secure your organization. So the baseline of communications, think about even with your partner or your best friend of 20 years or your employee, like communication to me is the cornerstone of every successful relationship. So when you're talking crisis comms, it's literal, it's the literal definition, right? Communicating during a time of crisis and your goal of course is to be effective enough to mitigate damage whether that's life safety whether that's brand reputation client reputation the goal is always to mitigate and coming from media a more pr vein you know your definition of crisis comms as security experts probably looks a little different what i would encourage everyone in the audience to rethink that is it shouldn't be siloed so at the north group we don't say, okay, here's the security concept of crisis comms and here's the, the communications, media relations, public relations side. We come from a multifaceted approach, so we give our clients and our, and our organizations a, a more value for us to be there. So when we have emergency response teams to respond to crisis, we don't just send our executive protection agents who are fantastic at their jobs, right? But we also send someone from our executive team, and if I can't be there, I'm on call because I'm looking at it from a brand reputation standpoint. And you might say, well, when you're dealing with a Fortune 100 company, they probably already have their own PR team, right? But that's not necessarily the case. I mean, it takes a lot of money to have your own branding and public relations team. So that's when someone from a security company like myself that handles communications can be, can be an integral part of adding value from, from our company's perspective, right? So again, you're trying to keep the, the mitigate, you're trying to mitigate, uh, keep the damage to minimal aspects, but you wanna get ahead of the information to control the narrative, right? You want to figure out the best way to disseminate that information, what should be put out there, has it been verified, get ahead of it all to control the narrative, especially now, because as we are all aware, we live in a different culture, we live in a canceled culture, so we can't afford to make the same mistakes and survive it the way we could have five, 10, 20 years ago. I like that because that ties into a lot of even the compliance debate we had yesterday. We were talking about insurance. Well, even if you get a payout from insurance, but your re reputation is in tatters, mm, it seems that crisis communications could be a good candidate for unifying the room, unifying convergence. But you know, people will probably say, oh, I know 100% what this means, but what's a crisis response comms plan look like? People say, oh, of course, it, 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 must, it must be somewhere in our SOPs, but, but what does it look like? Okay, so I would say a crisis comms plan. You're looking at 50% prep 
50% response, right? That's kind of how we look at it. If you can, we all get those calls that are immediate emergency help where you don't have time to prep. But if you do have time to prep, you wanna get all your ducks in a row. Everyone should know their role and everyone should, should have that kind of, I'm gonna talk a little bit about likening it to red teaming, but first I wanna talk about Again, in years past, a crisis comms plan may have been formulated, put on the shelf. You hope you don't have to use it for 10 years. Cannot operate in that mentality anymore because our culture changes, uh, the, the expectations of customers change. I mean, look at the messaging now and the expectations clients and customers have. They want to know that you are authentic and they want to know you are accountable and you are going to investigate and hold the person accountable for the wrongdoing if there was any wrongdoing. So the day of living quiet and saying no comment, I truly, from my perspective, believe that will be your demise. I don't think we live in a time where you can stay quiet anymore. You have to at least come out and acknowledge an incident and be authentic and have the point person being a good human, caring, right? Like that's what we have to do now. And I don't care if you're the owner of a security company, you run a security department, or you own a makeup company. The expectation is level set now. We're not getting an exception for that. Um, you know, the target breach, uh, when was, did Frank bring that up? Yeah, okay. So the target breach, perfect example of staying quiet and how it doesn't work, right? They did not, they were not forthcoming with the information Someone else broke that story. So Target then had to come out and say, yes, it happened, but then there was some information that was put out there that the customer's pins weren't leaked, but in fact they were. So now Target doubled down on incorrectly handling a PR response, right? And I don't like pointing fingers, I'm just pointing it out, like that was probably not the best response and it cost Target, so that's a perfect example. Now let's talk about a the example that's used in courses across the country as a stellar example. And it doesn't have to do with the data breach or use of force case, but it is still a good example. So J&J &J bottled Tylenol. Does anyone remember this? This is decades old, right? The cyanide, there were deaths, right. And so Tylenol came out, they pulled all of it off the shelves. It cost them millions of dollars in losses pulling medication off the shelf. They did it immediately. And the, the person at the helm of Tylenol at the time came out, was accountable, even though they, at the time, were pretty confident it was not their fault. They still gave a very charismatic, we care approach. And then they had an immediate resolution when they found out the bottles were in fact tampered with, the cyanide pills were put in to the bottles, post it being on the shelf. They had a resolution in place for tamper-proof product um, controlling the, the lid, right? So that's a perfect example. You had a response, you had accountability, then they went as far as to try to help the police in, in finding the person who murdered these people, which I don't know that they ever did, I don't, did they? Okay, and then they also had a resolution for here's our solution so this does not happen again. So Tylenol handled it brilliantly and there's a reason that specific case study or example is used in public relations courses in universities. Um, we are an audience of security folks, so I would say when you talk about crisis comms with your team, we talk about red teaming, right, in the security world and pressure testing. So do the same thing with crisis comms internally with your organization. What are we gonna do if this scenario happens? How are we gonna handle it? You do the exact same thing and everyone should know when to escalate and who to escalate it to, right? Because you don't want the spokesperson that you're gonna have delivering the message if you're a security company and, and something happens and there's a use of force incident, you don't want the spokesperson to be in that moment learning how to speak to the media and dealing in crisis. Like you need to know ahead of time. Everyone needs to be briefed up and ready to go so that when that happens, you have someone that is good on camera, they know how to deliver an authentic message, even if it's minimal information, you wanna do that in the prep phase, right? Then you've got social media, <laughs> right? Whole nother bag. So with social media response around a crisis, you need to have whoever that is on your staff monitoring that, prepared to bury 
bury the negativity, right? And you do that through social media strategizing, but you need to have that in place in your um, crisis comms plan, right? So that needs to be in there as well. And what I wasn't gonna talk about in this moment, but now I am after talking with Lester, is, and he spoke earlier about the concerns for the 2024 elections, which I think we all share and understand and can empathize with. So I went to a presentation a few weeks ago that ASIS put on in Seattle, which is where I'm from, and they talked about AI and how Microsoft now has developed a program that in two seconds can take your voice and, and fake phone conversations and audio recordings and now how is that going to play into the election process in 2024? So now, if you're doing crisis communications and you're protecting brand reputation, client reputation, now you have to put this in your crisis comps plan because you need to have a book of, okay, if this happens, how are we going to handle this? So now AI becomes a part of your crisis comps plan. So there's a lot to think about, Tom. That's my baseline message. There's a lot going on. Okay, well, what about the 800-pound gorilla in the, in the room? Legal. Legal. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Yep, it's in here. All right, there is a lot to get your head around, but already I see opportunities for everyone in the room coming together to help with this plan because it will touch them all, which is handy for a convergence forum. Yes. Um, <laughs> but surely all of this has to be done left of boom, left of bang. Surely you're going to have to work with a company to embed people ready for any crisis. Uh, or can it literally be solved on the hoof? It has to be, right? I mean, we don't live in a space where we can always have that embedded team. Sure, that's wonderful. Wouldn't we all already want to have knowledge of the culture of the company and the former threats and the lay of the land, but we're not always afforded that privilege. So I think this is where hiring the right people comes in. Um, and again, I'm fortunate in the North Group recognizing the parallels between media, comms, EP, right? Because in all of these situations, there's an immediate crisis, an immediate need to disseminate information, and then an immediate uh, tactic to lessen the damage. So in a situation where you are not afforded to have an embedded team already or have the prior knowledge of the corporation or organization, you have to just start with the facts. This is what we know right now. Understanding that you're gonna get more information, it is fluid, information changes, um, emergency response teams when you send them out. All you can do as a company, right, is get them as much information as possible and communicate it in a way so that your folks on the ground understand and they can continue to have that funnel of information. But again, the security concept is it's got to be all encompassing. That's how we look at it. And again, you might get to a situation where you don't know the culture, you don't know anyone there, and you might have a weak link in the PR department, and now you're, you're responsible for a whole lot more than just physical security. You don't have to be, but if you want to set your brand apart, you're always looking for that value add that the next guy doesn't have. And if you can add this multifaceted approach and add positions that typically weren't in a physical security company, you've managed to do that. And do you think you can get buy-in because the language has shifted to mm, nodes, right? I'm going to throw that word out, nodes. Everything is a node, an information point. Okay, it's a little bit of a headache if you're a man guard and then suddenly you have to do lots of reporting. But every single uh, SOC analyst is a node. Uh, every single uh, EP agent is a node. Um, and, and maybe we don't talk about it in that terms, but, but since they are feeding you information, how relevant is that in your plan? To, to, to make sure no one is forgotten. Because you can imagine that the, the guard in a muddy field, 3 a.m., really, really miserable, suddenly they are the point person. Ground up, right? You've got to think ground up because you don't know when a crisis is going to hit and you don't know who's going to be representing your company at the moment. So you better make sure that everyone that works for your company has at least a baseline of understanding how to operate effectively in a crisis situation. And the most recent example that's the easiest is... Uh, and you'll appreciate this uh, since you work for the Suns, is the San Antonio Spurs incident, right? 
So for those of you not familiar with that, which I'm sure most of you are, um, there was an EP agent who just happened to be the director of security for the San Antonio Spurs. He was protecting his principal, who happened to be a star player, and Britney Spears decides she wants to talk to him. So there's no prior communication between her publicist, the EP agent, or, or the, the basketball player, and I, I'm, pardon me, I forget his name, but, um, but his publicist. So she just comes up as he's entering a restaurant in Vegas in a casino, and she puts her hand on him. So the EP agent uh, knocks her hand away, and it hits her in the face, her own hand, okay? But Brittany goes on social media and says she was hit by the EP agent. Now my point to bring this story is up, I'm not a protector. I am not gonna sit here and say he did this wrong, he did this right, that is not my place. What I will say is it illustrates that at any moment now, people that were used to being under anonymity or operating kind of veiled are now the center of the story. I know his name, Damian Smith, and I can pick him out of a lineup. Why? Because all of a sudden, the agent became the star of the story and the center. And, and so you have to now talk to your people. If you're, you manage a department, you have to talk to your agents. If you own a company and you're CEO of a security company, you have to talk to even you know your security guards, maybe, if, you're, if you don't do executive protection, if you do more guard work. Like, you have to talk to everyone so they understand when it is how their actions can be appropriate or inappropriate. Now, I want to be very clear. Before, when I said staying quiet would be your demise, that is from a public response spokesperson. You do not want your agent in the moment making a comment, so no comment is appropriate then, or we will release a comment soon. I don't want anyone in the moment reacting. And so you have to think about that and train your people up on that. And one thing that we kind of talked about getting to legal, the gorilla, right, is we talked about, so Damian Smith, the, the agent in this situation, I'm imagining his motivation was to de-escalate. But he went over to Britney Spears almost immediately and apologized to her. Now from a crisis communications, public relations aspect, that makes me go, no. <laughs> because there could be severe legal implications with that. When you apologize, he just admitted to putting his hands on her. You cannot have an executive protection agent or officer in the field do that because it could have legal impl implications for your client, for your own company. So that's why, again, you have to train up and make sure everyone knows when to escalate, who to escalate to, what is my role in this moment, you know? And then what happens also, right, is if you have someone that does make a mistake, as an executive leadership team, have you discussed what you're willing to stand by and what you're not willing to stand by does everyone know your branding and messaging of your own company and mission? Because some, some companies would be okay with a certain level of use of force, and some wouldn't. But know your line, get ready to tow it, and say, in the event of this, this is how we're gonna handle the situation, right? So make sure everyone knows your company stance, your narrative, and then if you get into trouble, consult. Which it points us to a, a new leader of convergence. Uh, you know, not the CISO, not the CIO, not the CSF, not general counsel necessarily, but maybe comms, because you have permission. Maybe permission is another word for convergence. You have permission to talk to these people. They're expecting your call. I mean, how 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 accurate a description is that? Uh, uh, or, or, or would you phone up facilities and they say, oh, who are you? Uh, you know, uh, how much permission does a crisis uh, communicator have? Well, I mean, you're asking it by a source, so. But I, I think that every, every good team, and I, again, I understand that some smaller boutique security companies don't have budget to have a VP of comps. I totally respect that. But I think when you're in a situation and you can have that luxury or you have your CEO train up 
to be on camera. You, you take a speaking course or you learn how to be more authentic and talk more naturally, right? Like you can be trained to do all of these things, but I think having someone in a leadership position that can be ahead of information, control the narrative through comms is vital in our time now more than ever because we can't have the luxury of making a mistake when we respond in a crisis anymore. It is gone. I mean, there are so many examples to point to. Anheuser-Busch is the most recent colossal, colossal yes. mistake, right? So like there are so many things like that to point to. Uh, Victor, the back. Yeah, so being, you know, working for a, a company and needing and, and requiring me to have you know, third party vendors for executive protection, what would be your recommendation as the head of EP to go after these companies and say, hey, these are the things I require from you? Because, I mean, those are important things, but I'm relying on third party to manage that risk. So, so I think you have to have conversations with that third party, like you said, and say these are the expectations, and maybe you build in when you do your onboarding paperwork from this point forward, maybe you build something in in your onboarding paperwork, like this is our new, this is an aspect of our physical security program that is now integral, and it's having protection around moments of crisis and how we communicate in those moments, and these are the expectations we have of your company as well. So just to kind of answer, uh, piggyback on what you're saying. Yeah. So we do a, what's called an incident command flow chart, and that starts from the front line, uh, and that determines whether that crisis communication plan is going to be activated. And that is shared with our event production team, even third parties outside of our arena. And I think that's something that everyone should have to have a baseline uh, start of communication for everyone to follow. That's including our internal employees and also our external vendors. So is that, you use that as both as a procedure part of the, the risk framework? Correct. And thanks, so. Ed. You know, some excellent points. When you're dealing with social media, it becomes increasingly difficult. How do you deal with the psychotic spamming troll? In other words, you're feeding them every time you feed something Correct. in and they're totally putting it back on you. So you have to, right? I would liken this as to when you fight with your wife. You have to know when to call it, right? You, you attempt to de-escalate and when you realize... Remote control. Correct. Just give her the remote control at some point, the one that works. But, um, but I would say just de-escalate and keep it as as above like we appreciate I'm, I'm a big fan of like saying you know what i hear you i appreciate this feedback let's chat more about this right and just keep and feed them a little bit like i hear you because that's all they want they want attention they want to be important they want to be heard right but you cannot argue with crazy all day long you just can't so at some point you have to cut your losses and then you have to make sure that they aren't becoming an actual threat and that's when I rely on our Intel team to help me with that. And of course we will have an Intel specific panel later on, but I, I guess maybe this is another area of convergence. How important is it that you get relevant Intel feeds? What makes Intel for you? Because quite often people say, oh, Intel is only Intel if it's actionable. Well, in a crisis communications plan, what's actionable? Like, it, it's, it's all information, but what's actionable? So again, because of my background and because of the liberty the North Group affords me from operating and thinking from a media perspective, I liken it to investigative reporting, right? It's the same thing with Intel. You take information, you gather as much of it as possible, you trust but verify, right? So you have to take the information, pull the string, right? And see what the story is, the picture. Is it becoming clearer? If it's becoming clearer, then your Intel's good, right? And I, again, I'm not an intel gal, I don't want to pretend to be, but I did do investigative reporting and I think there are parallels, right? So you have to make sure that the information you are receiving is accurate, it's been confirmed, verified, before I ever went live on the air to confirm sources. So then you are communicating the right information, 
you're not disseminating misinformation and certainly not disinformation, but I'm talking about misinformation. And you have to look at the information you're provided once you, you verify it and then look to the second or third order effects, right? So the story the info is telling you and then the implications that could have and will those events be put into motion? So I think, again, there's parallels. It's, it's just information. Think of it as your friend. As much information you can have, some would argue passive is irrelevant if it's not actionable. Again, I'm not an intel person, but as an information lover and connoisseur of knowledge constantly, I think all information that comes my way, if it's verified, is active um, in my mind because then I can bank it and put it on the shelf and maybe I don't need that information right now or for this but I might need it later. So I think you can't have too much information if it's verified and then you know it's your friend. It helps you craft the proper message. It helps you disseminate to the people that you need to get to and effectively communicate to whoever you are communicating with or for. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Natasha, how then can people engage you or the North Group or someone like you, because I think I think maybe that's a point of action. We need to have an action call uh, with, with all of this. What, what what should they do to, to talk to you more about this? Well, I'm on LinkedIn and I love to talk, so you can find me there anytime. Um, and then also, I think my recommendation for anyone that's thinking, hmm, you know, like. I would like to have our own comms person or our own consultant local to who we can call. I would say treat it just like you would a vendor or a partner. Look for proven past performance in scenarios where there's yielded a good outcome. And I am, I am show preference to former media people because it's kind of like, not that if you can't do a good job at handling a PR response if you haven't had media uh, training or you haven't been in the news or a background. But when you are in the field and you are gathering information and there is gunfire behind you and you have to keep cool live on the air and disseminate the information effectively and, and correctly, I think that just affords you a little bit more capability, especially in our sector where it can be very volatile and we're dealing with life safety issues. So my recommendation would always be to look for proven past performance but then go beyond that and maybe see if someone has had years of experience of being of, you know, under pressure and being able to execute and communicate properly. And if you don't have the budget to pay a consultant, what I would suggest you do is be creative in ways of talking to someone in the media, right? So present a scenario where you just want their expert opinion and then you talk to them for a few hours and you get valuable information for nothing. So, you know, you can do that too. But I'm happy to talk to anyone, LinkedIn, Natasha Ryan. Thank you. Well, Natasha, thanks for coming down. Thanks for representing the both group. And a uh, big round of applause for you.